Okay, let's open up our Bibles to Matthew, the Gospel, chapter 23, and we will be looking at verses 37 through 39, so the last three verses of that chapter. Uh, The hardest thing for a parent to do is to discipline their children. One, it hurts the parent. Because you're literally disciplining that child, whether with a belt, with, with a hand to the seat of understanding, or put in the corner, or they can't go out and play for a week, or for a year, <laughs> depending on what they do. You know, as a parent, it does hurt, because you, you watch them, you know, sob and cry, and you're like, oh, you know, and, and then usually you don't, usually parents don't. Uh, keep their discipline on their children. Usually they get away with a, a lesser sentence than what was given out to them. And so there's a tendency of parents getting hurt emotionally because they're watching their children. They love them very, very much and they know they have to discipline them and teach them something, but at the same time you get emotional, right? You ever spank your kid and then afterwards go, oh, let me give you a big hug too, you know, because you get emotional. You don't want to do that, you know? And then the, the second thing is that you think that the child might get the wrong idea thinking that you hate them, right? Because you're disciplining them, you know, and you get those remarks, you hate me, you don't love me, you know, no, it's because I love you, that's why I'm disciplining you. That's what the Bible says. And so, so there's these things that are going on in our minds and in our emotions as we discipline our own children, right? I mean, we want to do the right thing. We don't want to hurt them. We don't, definitely don't want them to hate us or despise us or think that we don't love them. We want them to know that we love them. And so really the key is communication, isn't it? Uh, really hugging them and loving them and, and doing whatever you can to create that relationship so they understand that when I discipline you, it's for a good reason. It's because I love you. It's because I don't want to see you go down the wrong path. That communication. And when there's that communication and that understanding between both of you, then the relationship is wonderful. You know, we, we mess up and we need to have grace once in a while, but we also need discipline. And that's where we have Jesus. We have him in a situation where he is overlooking Jerusalem and these emotions are within his heart and in his mind as he overlooks Jerusalem. In the previous verses, Jesus pronounces some woes against the scribes and the Pharisees. You know what a woe is, right? When you're in trouble, it's like, whoa, I'm in big trouble. It's not little trouble, it's a woe trouble. It's one of these troubles that not just a whipping, but there's some other consequences along with the whipping. And Jesus pronounces these several of these woes in the previous verses towards the leadership of Israel because of the hardness of their heart, because of their selfishness, because they had the wrong perspective of who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. They felt threatened by Jesus, that he would take everything from them And so they hardened their hearts towards Jesus Christ. And because of that, Jesus pronounced woes upon them. And at the end of this chapter, we see Jesus who loved the one thing in his life, and that is Israel itself, become disloyal to him. And because of that, because of their rebellion, he has no choice but to judge them. And that's the hardest thing, I think, for him to do. Loving them, caring for them, reaching out, trying to communicate with them, but they just didn't want to receive it. And so he has to do the thing that he did not want to do, and that is to judge them. And so we get this picture of pity, and we get this picture of regret at the same time from Jesus Christ. You know, we see the very heart of Jesus here. It's a glimpse Even though there's three verses here, there's a lot here for us to contemplate about Jesus. We see his very heart, his love for Jerusalem, his love for the leadership, his love for the people. And yet at the same time, he has to judge them because they rejected him. And that, I'm sure, hurt him 
very deeply. And so let's look at this as Jesus weeps over Jerusalem here. Let's read verses 37 through 39. Old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Three small verses, but there's power there. There's insight there for us to grasp. This is Jesus' last week on this earth. Uh, He has been dealing with the religious leaders. He's been answering questions from his disciples. He's been looking to the cross, the stress of the cross. Uh, After this, shortly, he will be in the garden praying. Sweats of blood pouring from his body because of what he was about to do for you and for me. And here he sits on the Mount of Olives, probably, overlooking Jerusalem. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a place of worship. Earlier, he took a whip and began to chase out the money changers out of his father's house. He said, it's, it's become a den of thieves when it should be a house of prayer a house of praise, a house of worship. How sad that the church uh, would do that to God's church, in a sense. Uh, Not that this building is anything, but within the church, and to make it relevant today, you know, this church is a place that we come to, what? Worship the Lord, where we come to uh, hear His word, to be equipped for the work of the ministry. And so often... In the churches, there's division, there's backbiting, there's gossiping, you know, and all these things. And yet, Jesus is probably sad and going, oh, church, oh, church, oh, church. Because his heart is for the church. His heart is for unity. Now, he repeats the name twice here. Why is that? The expression that he's giving to us by repeating the word twice is an expression of affection and concern for the city. Uh, the, the letter O in the front emphasizes that, doesn't it? O Jerusalem. And then Jerusalem. It's almost like, just can't say it once. Let me say it twice. It's a Hebrew expression of intimacy uh, we find in the Greek. He's revealing his heart for Jerusalem because he loves Jerusalem. Um, He cares about Jerusalem just like we care about our children. And and when we are ready to discipline our children, what do we do? We call them by their full name, right? (laughs) We call them by their full name. Valerie. (laughs) I got in trouble for that one. (laughs) Because no one calls me Valerie. (laughs) Call me Val. I don't know why yet. (laughs) But, you know, same with Virginia. I always call Virginia Jin, G-I-N. I've taken the middle part of her name, and her name is Jin. But when I'm upset, I go, Virginia. (laughs) And so when she hears the word Virginia, she knows, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, what did I do now? You know, and, and we do that. And so Jesus here, because he has this intimacy and this love for Jerusalem, he says the name twice. We don't want to hear the name twice for coming from God. You know, we, we want to hear it once, and then we say, yes, Lord, what is it that you need? I'm, I'm available and ready for you, Lord. You know, it kind of reminds me of Samuel, right? The Lord had to speak to him how many times? When, you know, he came out, yes, Lord, and you know, didn't, didn't do anything. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, and finally he says, what do you want? <laughs> you know, say that, and then the Lord will speak to you. So Jesus uses his expression. Now, Luke tells us in chapter 19, verse 41, that as he drew near to the city, that he actually wept. Jesus literally wept over Jerusalem. When God spoke to Abraham at Mount Moroni, and you remember he was about ready to plunge that knife right into the heart of his son Isaac, what did God say? He said, Abraham, Abraham, he said it twice. That intimacy, that love. When he called Moses to the burning bush, he said his name twice. Moses, Moses. 
again twice. And, and we see it in, in the gospel too. He hasn't changed. The same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow uses the same terms just as he did here, old Jerusalem, Jerusalem. But with uh, Martha, Jesus answered her and said, Martha, Martha, you worry about so many things, you know. Don't worry about it. I love you, in a sense, saying her name twice. And even Simon, who uh, the enemy wanted to sift as, as wheat, you know, said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan wants to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. Again, saying it twice because I love you and I want you to know that I am concerned for you. And so he said the same thing to Paul also as he fell to the ground and heard the voice of God saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So important. My God, my God, Jesus said upon the cross. You know, that intimacy. So he calls to you and to me too. Let's make it relevant for today. He's calling you, you know, to intimacy. He's using your name. Put your name there. And Jesus would say it. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, Randy, Randy. Oh, Reuben, Reuben. You know, I, I desire to have intimacy with you. And that's really what Jesus wanted. He, he wanted his people, Israel, to accept him as the Messiah. To receive him in as his king and his Lord. To welcome the kingdom of God. Not in a physical sense. And not to establish some kingdom on earth, but to establish a spiritual kingdom. To once and for all deal with the sin that the enemy had brought into the world. In fact, in Jude's uh, writing, he said to those who are called, and God calls us, those that are his, to a right relationship with him. I got a call tonight from a person and it was interesting because he had some questions he wanted to know if I had 10 minutes and it turned out to be about 20 minutes and he had some questions about abortion he believed in abortion he said he was a democrat but that he was a believer I said okay I'll answer your questions so we went through the questions and so forth and, and finally the Lord just revealed to me that he's really not seeking for answers he just wants to uh to change people's mind or rationalize what he believes in because no one's able to logically talk him out of it. You know? And so I, I just basically said, uh, this conversation is over. You're not really looking for answers. You know, you're just looking to argue and, and rationalize uh, abortion. He said, let me just ask you one more question, one more question. I go, no, I think we're done. I said, in fact, let me ask you a question. He says, have you ever told a lie? And he goes, yeah. I go, what does that make you? A liar. I go, have you ever stolen anything? You know, and I went through that whole thing. Yeah. I go, well, have you ever committed adultery? He goes, no, I haven't committed adultery. I says, now you're married, right? And he goes, no, I, I have a girlfriend. I go, oh. So ha are you sleeping with your girlfriend? Well, yeah. I'm like, oh, so you're committing a fornication. Well, wait, wait a minute. And then he rationalized by saying, so you think a piece of paper that the government gives you says that you're legally married? Do you, don't you think that God knows that if you're committed to a person that, you know, you're married? And I says, okay, let's, let's take that out of the equation then. I'm not going to argue with you on that because I know where you're going with that. He doesn't want to hear it. I said, have you lusted for a woman? He's like, well, that's what, it depends on what you mean. What do you mean by that? I go, come on, you know what I mean. He goes, sex? I go, Yes. He goes, then you committed adultery, you committed fornication. I go, if you stand before God, are you guilty? He says, I'm guilty. I go, you're not going to heaven, buddy. You have greater problems than abortion. And right away he says, oh, I got to go. I'm, I'm late for work. You know, <laughs> just immediately, right? See, God wants a relationship with us. He's calling us. And we rationalize all these things to stay away from him. And how sad that is when God is calling our name. We need to respond in the right way. In the right way. So Jesus calls upon Jerusalem here. And unfortunately it's, it's sad because he describes the character of Jerusalem in the next statement. The one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. And it was the Jews who killed their own prophets. How sad. I mean it's bad enough that. You have these other nations surrounding Israel and they're coming in and they're taking them captive and they're killing them and destroying them and overtaking them. But then to have your, your own people kill you 
And, and we see that throughout the scriptures, right? The leadership of Israel were the ones that stoned the prophets. The kings were the ones that, you know, say, call the prophets, but don't call God's prophets. Call these other prophets that always prophesy the, the good things for us and that are with us, you know, and don't want to prophesy what God really wants us to do. Because they didn't want to hear what God wanted to uh, direct and, and guide them in. They wanted to hear that they were okay and that they'd win the war when God says, no, you won't. And so they would take these prophets and they would stone them. They would kill them and so forth. You remember the parable. Let me read it to you in Mark chapter 12. It says, and he began to speak to them a parable. That is, Jesus, a man, planted a vineyard, and the vineyard represents Israel. And he set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower so you get this picture of this vineyard and hedges around it, and there's a big tower on top to kind of keep uh, eye on the vineyard and oversee it. And he leased, the vine- he leased it to the vine dressers. The vine dressers were the leadership of Israel. They will be the ones in charge of Israel themselves. They will be the spiritual leaders of that land. And went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent his servant to the vine dressers. They might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And this is what the vine dressers did. Look, uh, I own the land. I'm leasing it to you. And now I want some fruit. And then I'm sending my, my convoy of men to get some fruit. And what you do, you beat them up. You stone them. You kill them. Because you don't want to give up a little bit of your fruit. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent them another servant. And at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others. Now you see the, the progression. You know, they beat up a little bit, then they bruised others, and they hurt others, and then all of a sudden they killed the others as it progresses. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last saying they will respect my heir come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours so they took him killed him cast him out of the vineyard therefore what will the owner of the vineyard do he will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others that is the gentiles have you not read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected have become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it, is a mar- and it is marvelous in his eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken a parable against them. So they left him and went away. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. <clears throat> Religious leaders persecuting their own people. Turn to Hebrews. Uh, look at some of the things that they did. Chapter 11. We call it the Hall of Faith, but unfortunately it's sad that their own people did this. It's sad when, you know, again, let's be relevant. It's sad when the church is in disarray and it's divided. It's sad when the church is fighting against itself. You know, it's very sad that we can't be more encouraging. Uh, We can't be more... Loving and caring, and it's sad because we only bring judgment on ourselves. And it's exactly what Israel was saying. Look at verse uh, 4. It says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, and God testified to this gift, and through it he being dead, still speaks. And and we know who killed Cain, his brother. By faith, Enoch was translated so that uh, he did not see death and was not found because God translated him. For before his his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. And by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And so he he lists some of these things that these guys did, and then he might... And then he begins to talk about the suffering and the affliction that uh, came upon them. Um, by fa- look at verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled seven days. By faith Rahab did not perish 
with those who did not believe. Then she had received the spies in peace. And then uh, what more can I say for the time will fail me uh, to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, uh, Jephthah, and even David and Samuel, the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, quenched the violence of fierce, escaped the edge of the sword, out of the weakness were made strong because of valiant, they were valiant in battle, turned to fight the enemy of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mocking and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sewn in two, uh, were tempted, were slain with the sword. Uh, they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And so we see the persecution of the saints, of the prophets coming upon the believers and from their own people. And yet they, these people were faithful, weren't they? They received the tortures, they received the payments of righteousness yet not obtaining the promise that was to come in the future. That is, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross because it took place. But they look forward to that day when Jesus would come upon the cross. Why do Christians hurt each other? Let's make it relevant today because this affects us as, as a church and as believers. And I'm not just talking about this church, any church. Uh, we hear it all the time. There's always division. There's always hatred. Uh, not even in the church, just within the church, just the people with people and Christians and Christians and this disagreement and arguing and fighting and so forth. Someone wrote this. Remember when your mama used to tell you, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all? Remember that? And it's mostly true, isn't it? I mean, sure, there's times when uh, decency or moral truths causes us to stand up and, and we need to make our voice known on what is right and so forth. But, but in reality, there's a lot of things we just need to stay out of people's business and stop being in their business and start serving God in his business. Listen to what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no division among you, that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. What was his encouragement? To agree with one another. In what agreement? That's important. What do we agree on? Agree on the scriptures, the fundamental things of Christianity. On those things that don't matter, just move on. It's like this guy, he just wanted to argue and, and rationalize, and I finally says, we're just wasting our time. It's time for me to stop. You know, There's no reason for us to continue on. Because you really don't want to hear truth. You know, I, I told him, I said, look, he says, convince me that abortion is, is wrong. I said, okay, one scripture. God says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. So we have no right to take life. He goes, okay, 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 but, but, you know, he goes, what about the world? You know, uh, they're not under scripture. I'm like, no, we're talking about you. We're talking about you. There's the scripture. Very simple, very clear. So we need to agree on that. But we're not agreeing on this. Why? Because he has all other motives. It's probably because, you know, and I'm just guessing, maybe his girlfriend's pregnant. You know, who knows? And so he's trying to rationalize it. Paul also said in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13. It was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And yet the Bible says no man needs anyone to teach them Really? That's true. The Holy Spirit teaches us. I can't teach you. But God's call, pastors and teachers, what? To unify us. To build us up. Because some of you need teaching so that when the Spirit illuminates that teaching, you accept it as truth. And really what we need is to be in unity with the Word of God again. 
because God calls pastors and teachers leadership to lead the body of Christ, to equip them for the work of the ministry. And so many get offended when leadership directs various ministries and various people, encouraging and strengthening them to walk in the right way, to serve God. And we get offended of that. You know, that's not walking in unity. Paul also said in Colossians 3, 13 through 14, bear with one another, forgive whatever grievance you may have against another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Boy, that's pretty clear. Don't hold any grudges at all because the Lord forgave you. And the Lord's prayer, he says, he also says that too, forgive one another as I have forgiven you. In fact, there's one place where Jesus said, if you're not willing to forgive, I'm not going to forgive you. See, I'd rather have a forgiving heart than not because then God will forgive me when I fail him. And so my heart is always to forgive them and forget them. It doesn't mean that you have to you know, go and love all over them and have chicken with them every night. You know? It's just you forgive them and you love them and you're kind to them and you, you know, help them if you can help them. But if not, that's, that's fine too. But you can't hold grudges and you can't have unforgiveness in your heart towards them. Towards anyone, by the way. It doesn't matter if uh, they're believers or they're non-believers. It's not good for a Christian to hold a, a grudge in their hearts at all. You need to let those things go. It just eats you up. John 17, 23. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The unity with Christ Jesus. Psalms 133. How good and pleasant it is that the brethren dwell together in unity. 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Be compassionate and humble. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. 1 John 4, 12. I mean, it's pretty clear that there's enough scriptures to tell us that we should not be arguing and fighting and bickering and complaining and gossiping and murmuring and tail-bearing and all those things that the scripture says are wrong. You know, you know, you know what's the best way to not do that? Is be busy doing something for God. That's the best way. See, it's when you're idle and you're standing around talking and like, oh, did you hear? What? Now, if you're out raking, then, you know, you're raking. Okay, I'm going to rake this. Oh, I don't like doing this so much. And it doesn't feel, yeah, but in, you know, you're not busy talking. You're not busy allowing the flesh to flare up. You're doing something for the kingdom of God. So stay busy, stay focused, study your word, be in it. You start talking, get into the word of God and start reading and so forth so that you don't fall into that trap. James says in 401, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight wars and yet you don't have. It's because you want something. That's where these wars and battles come from. And so Israel, and he's speaking to the leadership here. You took the prophets and you stole them. You're the leadership. You're to be the example. You're to lead them. You're to, you're to train them up for the work and yet you would take these prophets that I sent to my people and you would destroy them. You would kill them. In fact, you'll crucify me in a few. He said, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now, you sense the anxiousness there in Jesus, right? How often I wanted, that was his heart. How often I wanted to gather you. That's the anxiousness. Again, like a parent. How often I, I wanted to bless you, but you just didn't let me because of your attitude, because of your rebelliousness. How often you know, has a pastor wanted the church to grow, but yet people just were not willing because they wanted their own way. They wanted to do it their thing and so forth. How often? Oh. Very often, very often. Yeah. And so he uses this analogy. You know, how often I just wanted to gather you as, a, as little children, as a chick gathers her children under her wings, but yet you weren't willing. 
and you almost get this picture of this this hen or this bird and trying to get the chicks. You know, you can almost see this happen. I've seen it happen. You know, in neighbors' yards and so forth. You go to places, and the, the mother hen is trying to gather chicks, and they're running around, and she's trying to get them under her to protect her, but they keep running, and she keeps chasing them, you know, and that's how Israel is. That's how we are sometimes, aren't we? You know? And so he uses this analogy, using nature as a method of, of teaching towards the children of Israel, and especially for the disciples, you know. In the Old Testament, God portrays uh, the eagle hovering over uh, its offspring as him protecting Israel under his wing. It's an analogy that uh, he used in the Old Testament. Isaiah 31 5 says, uh, like birds flying about. And so this analogy of a, a bird loving and caring for its own. And so like a bird flying about, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem, defending. He will also deliver it, passing over. He will pre- preserve it. And so that picture of a hen gathering his chicks. I remember hearing a story years ago about a hen who had uh, gathered her chicks under her because there was a fire in the chicken coop. When the fire was all done and they put it out, they found the hen completely burned, toasted, still, still kind of sitting there with its form, but all charcoaled and gone. And as they went to move it out of the way, Underneath her came all the chicks running around. And they just went running all over the place. And so she protected her children from the fire. She took the death and the pain and the suffering so that they could live. That's the heart of Jesus. And that's the heart of a parent. And that's the heart of a pastor in the church. To flourish and to multiply and to grow. Uh, that That should be the heart of this nation. But it's no longer. Jesus today would probably say... Oh, United States, United States. You who take prayer out of school. You who no longer believe in the Bible to be the word of God. How often I wanted to prosper you even more. It's the heart of God for growth and so forth. It's the heart of the pastors of, of the United States to reach the loss in the community. You know, my heart was moved... Uh, this afternoon, we were praying, and um, we prayed. Roman actually brought it up, uh, some prayer for the community kids here, because one of our signs got tagged really good. You know. And I, personally, I've seen it before with our signs, so I didn't really get too upset about it. I mean, it's, it just happens, you know. And you have this, this is, this is, this is the war we fight here in this area. You know, this is the war we fight. So Roman prayed for them, whoever they are, these kids, and, you know, whatever they're doing. And my heart just broke, and and I just said, Lord, in my mind, I'm thinking, how do we show them you love them? How do we show them that? Because that's what they're looking for. That's why they they hang around these guys and their friends, and they you know, create this little gang, because they want family. They want love. They want to know that, hey, this guy's got my back and he loves me, he's going to take care of me. They're looking for that love. And that's the heart of any pastor, is to reveal the love of God to them. How do we do that? You know, and in my head, this is what I thought. This is what I thought. Maybe the Lord's going to lead me to do this, but I want to put a big sign out there, not a four by eight. I want to put a billboard <laughs> and it just says, God loves you. you know, and, and maybe even under say, you know, just as you are. I don't know. Would that get their attention? I don't know, but the Lord just kind of you know, brought that across my mind because they need to know that. They need to know that. The United States needs to know that. The children need to know that their parents love them and so forth. You know. But in spite of all that they did, Jesus still looked at them as a hen would gather its chicks. And God's love doesn't diminish at all whatsoever. He still loves us just the same today as he loved us before. And he'll never refuse us if we take the opportunity to come to him. So he expresses this human affection for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he says, see, your house is left to you desolate. So a man will reap what he sows. So you see what happens because of your rejection and your rebelliousness? You're going to reap what you've sown. 
And unfortunately, that saddens my heart, but it's coming your way. And this is a prophetic word to them, too. You know, prophetic word. It was said of D.L. Moody, he was the only man living who should preach on hell because he did it with such compassion. Can you imagine that, teaching on hell? But yet people were, were touched because he did it with compassion. Uh, I think more is true of Jesus, right? He could teach on hell, but you knew that he loved you. Somehow, some way, uh, you're condemned. I'm not condemning you, but yet you're condemned to hell, to burn for eternity. And I'm here extending my hand out to you. Come unto me, and I'll give you life, you know. And, and preaching it in such a way that, that people are like, I want to come to you, Lord, and not go to hell. You know, because I see your heart and your love and your sincerity for us. And Jesus is saying, you received the opportunity of God's grace, but yet you refused it. And thus the nation Israel will be no longer a light through which God would shine forth in a dark world. But he would use another nation, another group of people, and that is the Gentiles. So your house is left desolate. Jesus wanted to protect them from the terrible judgment that would follow their rejection of him, but their disobedience would not allow that. And so judgment was coming upon their house. Desolation. It was disobedience of Adam and Eve that moved them from their house, wasn't it? It's not what God wanted. He said, just don't eat of the tree of life, and you could live for eternity in these conditions. Can you imagine that? We'd still be there today, all of us, because it would be fruitful and multiply, and we'd be in the garden to this day if they were not disobedient in eternity, like living in heaven down on earth. But because of their disobedience, they lost their home. They lost their place. It was the idolatry of both the northern and southern kingdom of Israel that destroyed the Jewish temple, right? We reap what we sow. It was never the Lord's plan to destroy the children of Israel. It was never the Lord's plan to divide them. It was never the Lord's plan to put them into the hands of the Babylonians or the Assyrians. That was not his plan. That was not his heart. It's not his heart or his plan to hurt you. His, his plan is to love you, to prosper you, to bless you. But we rebel, and we reap what we sow. And he's saddened. And I think he weeps, just as he wept over Jerusalem. It's never the Lord's plan. Two things happen to Israel today. Because of this rebelliousness and Denying Christ as a savior, their temple was destroyed. Israel's been scattered abroad, but yet God has not forgotten them. He still loves them. Even though, even while you were still yet sinners, Christ died for you. Even while you were in your rebelliousness, God loved you. And his love is always available to you. And so today, Israel is training men to be priests in a new temple. God is laying on their hearts to build a new temple. God's laying on their hearts to prepare for the sacrifices and the offerings that all point to him. God is preparing. You know what he's preparing? He's preparing them for the tribulation period so that once again Israel will come back to him because that's where they come back to him in the tribulation period. And they will be on fire for him. And so we have to go through hardship in order to get to the heart of God. And God is working all that out for his glory. Let's look at this last verse. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now remember, he's speaking to the Jews there in Jerusalem, to the leadership. In a little bit after the Passover, the crucifixion and his death will happen and they will see him no more. Jesus won't return to Israel until the tribulation period. Oh, he was seen by his disciples here and there before he ascended on high, but he never went back to Israel or the leadership of Israel. And when the fullness of the Gentiles is over, then all Israel shall be saved, and the Jews shall be converted, and they will seek the Lord their God, and David their king. And they will cheerfully praise Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Isn't it interesting that Jesus tells them here at the end, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that when they see that him, they will shout that out. I love the way he ends this. You remember Sunday, Palm Sunday? 
as Jesus was entering Jerusalem and they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they wanted to crucify him. He's reminding them of their heart here. It wasn't it you who just a few days ago said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Surely you'll be left desolate, but I will come back. And when you see me, you will from your heart say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There'll be a new people. Only God does that. Only God can change a heart. Only God can take our hearts and make them new. God can take our hearts that have a love for the world and convert them to love the Lord if we're willing. If we're willing. And in these last days, I'm telling you, I think we need to love the world less, a lot less, as the day is approaching. We need to have hands off, guys. We need to start thinking about what is happening in our world today. It's crucial for us. So they'll cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let me close. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He loves us that much that he would call our names. He would say the same to us, that he'd want to gather us together under his wings of protection. Know this, that God wants to protect you. He loves you. But don't run from his wings. Don't scurry all over the place. Stay close to him. Jude would say, stay under the love of God. Stay under the love of God. There's so many that are taking the grace of God and they're turning it into lasciviousness, Jude says. But you, he says, stay under the love of God. Have faith in God. You know, be like Michael the archangel who argued with Satan over the body of Moses. And he said, the Lord rebuke you. He wouldn't bring an accusation against him, but he just trusted in the Lord and said, the Lord will take care of you. I'm just going to trust in the Lord. He would say that to us. The evidence is, the evidence is clear that Jesus Christ is coming back. He, he's coming back, and he's coming back soon. I really believe it. And I think we need to be ready. Our hearts need to be ready. Let me just share with you from my heart here. <clears throat> And because I'm sharing to my church here, my, my church, God's church, and he put me here to you. And this is to you from me. The Lord is doing a work. <clears throat> but this work can be destroyed that quick. It, it's on the verge of growing. And I'm not saying growth for a prideful purpose, but growth to reach this community. And that growth only comes because all of us, our church here, unites to say we want God to be active in our lives. We have over, and I'm just speaking personally to our church here, we have over 130 or so people, but yet on Sunday mornings we get less than 100 coming to church. That is sad, especially for the last days. It's evidence that we're in the last days because people's hearts are cold towards the things of God. Not only... Do we get less coming and committed to the Lord's uh, Sabbath day? But they come in late. And this is just my heart. This is our Savior. This is our Lord. We're to worship Him. We're to praise Him. We're to love Him. This is a small chastisement. Please take this with a grain of salt. When we come in here, we come in to worship Him. And we come in late. As someone said years ago, if we were to go see Captain America, if we were to go see the X-Men, I guarantee you, you won't go in late to see the movie. You'll probably go early to see all the trailers before the movie even starts. How sad. That's a sad commentary for us. That we would come in late when we want to worship the Lord. We want to prepare our hearts to receive from God. And yet we come in late. And then we don't stick around. And we just leave. I understand that, and I know that that happens, and I know people will come in late, I know that people will not stick around, but God wants us to fellowship. How are we going to come into the unity of Christ if we're not fellowshipping, if we're not 
allowing iron sharpening irons and working things out and getting the same vision and same goal. It can't be just the same amount of people doing the work. It has to involve everybody. Now I say this to you tonight because you're the Wednesday night. You're more committed than the Sunday mornings because you're here twice a week. And you're, and you're saying, I want more of God, and I want to hear what he's saying. Well, this is what he's saying to our church here, through me, is that if we're not going to get committed, we're not going to grow. We're not going to reach this community. We're just not. If we're not going to commit to evangelizing and sharing and passing out cards from here and there, inviting our neighbors and friends and loved ones, we really don't care about their salvation. We really don't. We should be looking for ways, and I, I, I'm not saying that you're not, but we should be looking for ways to preach the gospel message. I was cut, getting my hair cut just the other day. Created a relationship with this, this uh, young girl that cuts my hair. It's hard to find someone that cuts hair good. <laughs> you know, so it's like when I find one, I stick with them. Please don't leave because it's fa- fantastic. Sam, they leave every six months. You know, <laughs> they don't go on. You know, I go, please don't leave. I finally found one. You know, I've tried different places. But I create this relation. I just talk with them and, you know, share. And it turns out her dad was in prison. It turns out, you know, that he became a Christian and blah, blah, blah. So we're just talking. So I invited her to the, to the Easter thing. This is how you do it. You know, I'm not just saying, oh, you need to come to Jesus Christ right now or else you're going to go to hell. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying create relationships, take opportunities, and then you invite people to church. And I know a lot of you do that. Yeah. But if we're not doing those things, we're not going to grow. We're not going to impact this community. My heart is for this community. My heart is for those kids, uh, kids across this, the neighborhood here, next door and a few others. There was about six of them out here the other day playing soccer on our grass, you know? And, and I care more for them than I care for the grass. It, it reminded me of Chuck when, when the religious people of the church, like, hey, these hippies are coming in barefooted and blah, blah, blah. And Chuck said, tear out the carpet. We're so concerned about hippies with long hair and, and, and no shoes because we're concerned about the carpet. No, tear out the carpet, you know? And that's how I feel with these kids, you know. Now, we're trying to create a relationship with them. I went out there. I talked to them, you know. And, and I tell them, this is your place. This is a place where, where, where you can come out, hang out. You know, God has put us here, and God loves you and cares about you. And so, you know, hey, just take care of God's things. We want you to be responsible and so forth, you know. But I've invited them to the youth. I know Roman has. And we're just praying and asking if God could just get a hold of these kids' hearts. You know? But we need to have that vision. You need to have that love. If you're not sharing your faith, then you don't have love for the lost. No, you don't even have the heart of God because God's heart is for the lost. That's his whole heart. That's his whole purpose for coming. And so there's something wrong there, and, and it needs a change if you don't have a heart for the lost. The church has to have a heart for the lost. Otherwise, the church will distinguish. Is that the word? Not distinguish, extinguish. It will burn out. We have to have a heart for the lost. We have to have a heart for the youth. You know? I love you guys. I, I love what God is doing here. I love the group of people that are here now. It's exciting. It's wonderful. And we're on the verge. We're on the verge. But we're also on the verge of going the other way, direction too. Yeah. We have to have a heart and a priority for God first. It really has to happen. 